I just, I, just, I just need to pause and just like, did you notice what our pastor just did to, to me right there? I mean, he, he lifted me up and then he went for my knees that are already bad because I tore an ACL playing basketball and like, come on, man, do that to me. But no, I love him and I'm grateful to be here with y'all. I want to just take a moment and, um, and say thank you to Transformation Church uh, elders, uh, the pastors, the ministry leaders here for creating a space and a time for Pastor Derwin and Vicki and their family uh, to get some rest. And I just want to make this comment that ministry, particularly vocational ministry, is a 24-7 vocation. It takes a toll on your heart, on your mind, on your soul, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And what an incredible season, time for us to create some space for them to pray and, and connect and gain vision for the future of Transformation Church. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't just comment on that. Uh, this morning, I want to start by talking about things that we appreciate and things that we underappreciate. For instance, the other day, I was sitting down, and I was on my iPhone, and, and I realized that I have had my iPhone since the very first iPhone came out. Anybody in here have, like, you've been with iPhone since day one? Yeah, y'all are OGs. Good job. Excellent. And then I realized I have come to underappreciate my iPhone. Well, here's the thing. How, how do you know that you've underappreciated something? It's when that thing is either stripped and taken away from you or it is no longer uh, able to be used the way that it was intended. And so I was thinking about even how we come to worship, to service, and the songs that we sing and the worship team that leads us together. I think at times we can underappreciate what is actually taking place on the stage. So I want to invite you into a practice. I want to invite you into an experience. Over the next few minutes, I want us to pay particular attention to the distinction of each individual instrument. You see, we, we uh, over or underappreciate the whole when we don't take into account the distinction of the individual. Listen closely as each part of the instruments come together. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, listen to the list, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So, you also must forgive. And catch this, verse 14, this is how he ties this entire thing together. And above all these Put on love, which does what? Which binds everything together in perfect harmony. How? How, how? how can we appreciate compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, if we can't appreciate the beauty of the distinct individual amongst the whole? We can hear the distinct tone of the violin now more clearly because we can hear 
like the low rumble of the bass. We can uh, appreciate the crescendo of the drums because we have that subtle inclination of the pad of the keys in the background. The harmonies that are taking place on the stage right now is a collection, a, a, a concisely crafted construction of distinct tones and melodies that are laid together to create one beautiful experience. I'll give it up for the team. What is a harmony? What is a harmony? Webster defines it this way. It's the simultaneous combination of tones, especially when blended into chords pleasing to the ear. It's a chordal structure as distinguished from melody and rhythm. Here, here's another definition, and I love this one. What is a harmony? It is the science of the structure, relations, and practical combination of chords. And, and so my aim is, is real simple for our time together this morning. It's to take a moment, and we're gonna do two levels of exploration. One is uh, sociological, anthropological, our society, culture, and, and what it means to be a, a human. And the second is theological. So we're gonna go sociological first and then theological. But in order to do this, I need some help from all of y'all. So can you help me? Is that okay? Yeah? All right, only my son Levi is raising his hand. Everybody else is like, you are on your own. All right, here we go. All right, can y'all help me a little bit? Is that okay? Okay, good, 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 good. I'm going to say, I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to say, is there evidence of true harmony? And then I'm going to insert a word. Your job is very simple, all right? If there is true harmony, like what we just experienced right on the stage, if there's true harmony, you say yes. If there is not true harmony, you say no, right? Not rocket science. We can do this. Okay, is there evidence of true harmony in politics? Is there evidence of true harmony in religions? Is there evidence of true harmony in who is the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan or LeBron? L listen, I said yes or no. Y'all need to follow directions. I don't need the commentary, y'all. Is there evidence of true harmony in the superior technology of Apple versus Android? This is spiraling, spiraling down. Is there evidence of true harmony in the church? Oh, the tension. Oh, the tension of what is and what ought to be. Oh, the tension of a vision of the family of God Colossians 1.13, that he has transferred us, you and I, sinners captivated by our carnal desires, and yet Jesus the Messiah on the cross overcame sin and death in order to defeat sin and death through death itself, so that Colossians 1.13, that you and I might be transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son, Jesus himself. The Bible refers to this transference and this new embodied experience amongst all these different people as in Greek, the oikos tautheo, the household of God. It's a family. It's a family. And yet, how is it possible that within the family, there can be an absence of harmony? There can be the presence of chaos with the loss of peace. And what are the implications of this? I want to think about this now sociologically. Sociologically. What is the implication of disharmony within the church as it relates to those that are outside 
of the family of God. The presence or absence of harmonic unity in the church has a direct impact and influence on the perception of the church from two sets of people that I'm going to suggest, nominal Christians and non-Christians. Nominal Christians being the ones that grew up in the church, maybe from the moment that they were born, mama and dad brought them right away as newborns into the church. They heard the songs of the gospel and the verses of holy scripture reverberating in their hearts, in their minds, in their tiny little bodies from the very moments of their human experience. And yet somehow as they got into their teenage and adult years, what they heard to be true in the scripture scriptures is actually far incoherent with what they experienced in real life. So there's a a nominalness to it because there is an uncertainty about it. And the second group are non-Christians. So here's what I'm saying. In other words, how the family of God, how you and I, how we relate to each other impacts non-Christians and nominal Christians in their perception of how they would relate to God. I want to point out the disharmony between what the church thinks and what the outside world thinks with the help of some research. But before I get into that, I just want to point out that I was born and raised in Chicago. Chicago is one of the greatest cities, I might argue and say it is the greatest city of the United States. Why? Because Michael Jordan ran a three-peat and then repeated the three-peat. I had a really great discussion after the first service in the back. I think we can make a, a definitive argument that MJ would have probably done eight if he didn't retire. Right? Easy. Probably ten, but let's just be realistic, right? Eight. And so here's, here's what's happened. When you grow up in an environment, I grew up in Chicago, when you grow up in that environment, that environment reverberates around you, it becomes part of your being, and I'm just going to be honest, y'all, I am biased. I get it. I get it. Now, now here's what happens. Every year, whenever the NBA draft comes around, I've now been uh, away from Chicago for over a decade. I'm still a Chicagoan at heart, but, but the distance to what was familiar has given me, I don't know, a better clarity of reality of where the Bulls are today. So, for instance, after the NBA draft, all my cousins, all my friends, they're in the group chat. They're like, this is the year. We're going to do it. We're going to win the chip. I'm like, no, y'all, you're not. The Bulls still stink. It's been a long hiatus since MJ was soaring through the air. And then D. Rose showed us a little bit of of a glimpse of hope, and then he tore his ACL. It was done. The Bears have been tough since 1985. But isn't it interesting that when you're in that moment, when you're in that culture, you can come up with reasons to defend the thing that you love, that you think ought to be. I don't think this is any different from us as Christians. There's a Barna research that happened in 2019. The report went live in 2020, and um, it had some startling um, impact, some startling research data in, re- in, in terms of the relationship of how Christians perceived, you and I, how we perceive our, um, our impact of the culture onto the culture versus what non-Christians believe. So let me do this. Christians based off of the report, firmly believe we have a strong or positive impact on our community. 66% say very positive, and 28% say somewhat positive. I'm trying to do the math right now in my head. I know I'm Indian. I'm supposed to be good at math. It's like 90%, y'all. Over 90%, right? Right? That's a lot. Okay, check this. Non-Christians, I think this is, the details are important in this. Non-Christians were inclined towards non-difference or no impact. 39% within an, an additional 18% that would take a step further and actually say, no, it's actually a negative impact. So the non-believing world is looking in and saying, there ain't nothing good that we can get from y'all. It's a non-impact. It's an equal sum matter. 
And there's an additional group, and I actually think that that rate is, is slowly inclining over the years, that is actually saying, actually, it's the inverse. You, there's a negative impact that the church is having upon culture. Here's a, a scarier stat. There is a, a stat of the percentage of Christian millennials, and they agreed, 25% of them agreed, with non-Christians of the irrelevancy of the church in culture. That's like us, y'all. So, Joel, I, I thought this was Sunday morning at TC. I didn't know we were doing a stats class. What's going on? Why, why should we care? What can we pull from all of this? The way that we live and act in relationship to each other matters. It has an impact. Here's what I think happens, though, is we tend to think that the responsibility to put on display unity and harmony and the goodness of who God is is the responsibility not for me, but for the Christian celebrity or for the Christian author or the influencer with the millions on Instagram and TikTok that go viral. It's their job to figure it out. It's not my job because I'm just lowly little old me. But y'all, that's not how it works in a family. In a family, it's everyone's job because everyone is interconnected to each other. It's summertime in our household, which means all of our kids are home, and uh, we have summer routine for our children. They have chores to do. Chores, I got like two amens. Y'all are deep in the summer, right? Yes, for the chores. And, and so the, the chores are very important, right? So, so it is one child's job, their, their chore, to unload the dishwasher, right? It is the other child's job to load the dishwasher. Let me describe what happens sometimes in the mornings when Britt and I walk into this kitchen, which at night when we went to bed was a safe haven, but by the morning the kids have gone up before us, it is no longer safe nor a haven, Walk in and we look out and, and, and this is what we see. The dishwasher drawer is open. Potentially a good sign until you smell the aroma coming out of the dishwasher drawer, door. And you look over and you see the dishes are still full. One of the children has decided that they are unable to take the, the dishes, turn the dishwasher on, make sure that it's clean so they can unload the dishwasher. But this sets a chain reaction into place because if the dishwasher is full, what do you think the sink is now full of? Mm-hmm. All them dishes are all there. Now the smell is increasing in what was once a safe haven. It's no longer a safe haven. And now you go, okay, whoa, what just happened? The responsibility for the dishes to be clean, turned on, and then put away. Now the sink is full of all of the dishes, and the dishes are not loaded into the dishwasher. And now the third child is there, and the child's responsibility is to clean the tops of the counters. But I just have a question, y'all. If you have dishes, and you go into the sink, and the sink is full, and you've already done the Jenga, and you know that if you add one more thing on top, the whole thing is going to come down, where are you going to put the dishes? On the side. Guess what? Now this child cannot do his job because the dishwasher has not been turned on. The dishes have not been taken out. The dishes in the sink have not been placed into the dishwasher. And now we got all kinds of chaos and mess. It's a family. And the consequences of one family member always impact the rest. The consequences of one family member always impact the rest. How is it that the world has this perception, and how is it that that perception is actually um, culminating inside of the people of God? And, and here's my thought. I think it's because you and I, we have begun to believe an unrealistic expectation of what biblical unity is, and it's rooted in unbiblical ideas. So I want to present two false truths about Biblical unity, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. And let me just um, present it this way. Unity, when I talk about unity, and when I talk about harmony, the, 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 the distinct coming together in a beautiful way, it's a simple concept, yet it's far from being simplistic in application and execution. It's possible for something to be simple in thought and yet very complex in execution. 
And that is all over the place in Scripture. So here's false truth number one of biblical unity, that biblical unity always has in mind uniformity. Turn to Genesis chapter 10. And we're going to start in the section that in my Bible it says the table of nations. Now, typically when you turn to this place in the Old Testament, Genesis kind of 10, 11, 12, the focus is on Genesis 11, which is the Tower of Babel, and then Genesis 12. But, but as, a, as a student of the Bible, we've got to read the Bible in context with each other, which means if you want to rightly understand, if we want to rightly understand what's taking place at the Tower of Babel, and then what happens in Genesis 12, we actually got to start, y'all, in Genesis 10. And Genesis 10 is the table of nations. And what Genesis 10 and 11 gives us is actually a biblical vision before the consequence of rebellion in Genesis 11 of a type of unity that includes a distinction of people without them being divided. You're going to say, Joel, prove it. Happy to. Genesis chapter 10. We start in verse 5. These are the table of nations, the family records of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in verse 5 it says these. From these descendants, the peoples of the coasts and the, in, and the islands, they spread out into their lands. And, and notice this, according to what? According to their clan and their nations, each with its own language. So you've got a people, you've got a land, you've got a language, all before Genesis 11. Then you get to Genesis 20. These are, the, these are Ham's sons by their clans. Notice again the distinction. According to their languages, in their lands and their nations. What we have before we get to Genesis chapter 11 is the presence of a diverse group of humanity that each has distinct nationality evidenced by language. They all had different languages. They spoke, and there's intimacy because they had a, a family language. And then we get to Genesis chapter 11, it gets really interesting. And then Genesis chapter 11 says, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. Wait a minute. Joel, how does that work? Genesis 10 just said that there were many languages. Genesis chapter 11 says that they all had one language. Well, in my uh, doctoral dissertation, this is what I argued for, that actually what's taking place is this phenomenon called the lingua franca. Here's what that means. It means that there is one language that rules them all. We actually see this in modern day. Uh, if you go to India, I'm Indian. I don't know if you knew that, but I am. There we go. I speak Telugu. That's our family kind of national language, right? But everybody speaks Hindi. You could go to a different part of India and everybody speaks Malayalam. But guess what? Everybody also speaks Hindi. <laughs> you could go to a different place and, and, and it's like Tamil and also there's Urdu and, and guess what they all speak? Hindi. There's one language that connects all of the other languages together. What happens at the Tower of Babel? At the Tower of Babel, you have a group of diverse individuals separated by lands, language, and nations that are connected by one language that come together because they have ambition. But there's a question. Is their ambition holy or unholy? Are they motivated by a holy ambition or vain conceit? Prior to their rebellion, I want to point out there is nothing wrong or bad about the presence of diversity and the unity here. The issue is what that is aimed after. And what is this aimed after? A total rebellion. In Eden, God tells Adam and Eve, go out into the ends of the earth and, and, and pr present the goodness and the glory of God and spread it out amongst the earth. In other words, they're supposed to go out, but the people in Genesis 11 decide to go where? Up. Would you ever imagine what would have happened in Genesis chapter 11 if all of these people made up of all the different nationalities of the earth came together with not vain conceit but actually and holy ambition and they put the skills and the giftings and the type of unity that could be possible to align their hearts with the heart of God? Oh my goodness. The consequence for the rebellion 
is actually the loss of the one language that united them together because they took it for granted, because they misused it. And so they were separated out, and, and God's will is always gonna work out. And they still went out to the ends of the earth. But now we have the presence of division amongst humanity in a way that stripped apart the unity. Here's false truth number two. Biblical unity, that it requires an obliteration of diverse distinction. Here's what we've come to think, that if we want true unity in the world, that we all have to think the same, talk the same, look the same, act the same, believe the same. Is that actually true, though? Does the Bible actually point to that? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. This is referred to as the day of Pentecost where Peter gets up in front of all of these people and he tells of the great news of Jesus the Messiah. We'll start in verse three, Acts chapter two. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and catch this, began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Verse five is important. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem and devout people from every nation under heaven. All the nations, all the peoples seem to be present here in Acts two. Verse seven, they hear Peter speak and this is what it says. They were astounded and amazed saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native languages? Here's the list of nations, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. Mm. Here's a little bit of geographical information. If you took the list of nations in Acts chapter 2 and you laid them out geographically on a map and went all the way back to, Act, to Genesis chapter 10 and you took the list of nations that are, that are represented in Genesis 10 and you laid them out, guess what you get? The same scope of geographical land. In Acts chapter 2, we have a massive echo of Genesis 10 that leads us into Genesis 11. But what about Genesis 12? Genesis 12, after the aftermath of the rebellion of Babel, God makes a promise to Abram. This is what he says. I will make you into a great nation, verse two, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Catch this. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples, in Hebrew, this can also be nations, on earth will be blessed through you. Then we get to Acts chapter 2. What do we find in Acts 2? Acts 2 is not simply some New Testament scholars. They say, oh, this is a reversal of Babel. I disagree. Acts 2 is not simply the reversal of Babel. Pentecost is actually the redemptive reversal and reinstitution of Babel. Because the diversity wasn't bad. The distinction wasn't bad. The presence of harmony and unity wasn't bad. What was bad was the aim. What was bad was the object of affection. What was bad is selfish ambition and not a holy ambition. I find one detail in here to be more interesting than all the others. Can you imagine sitting there with all of these, it looks like this right here, like all the nations represented. And all of a sudden, Peter gets up and he starts to, to preach the story of the Old Testament to them. That's what he does in that sermon. He, he recalls the story of Israel and how God delivered them from Pharaoh and how he split the, I mean, this is just an incredible Old Testament seminar right there. 
And they're listening to this, and then all of a sudden, they, they look to their right, and they look to their left, and they begin to be a little confused. You see, because some of them are Romans, or Greeks, or Parthians, but then there's an Edomite. And they're all nodding their head. Like, yeah, that's so interesting. And the proclamation of those people is, how is it that we hear the wondrous works of God in our native tongues? Now, if I'm the Holy Spirit, we should be glad I'm not the Holy Spirit. But if I'm the Holy Spirit, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention to what's happening in the Greco-Roman world at the time. The Greek language is the world language of the time. Aramaic is another very important and well-known language at the time. I want to be efficient. I'm like, here are all y'all people. I'm just going to go ahead and use Greek or Aramaic, and yet the Holy Spirit doesn't do either. You see, the Holy Spirit and God himself is more interested in intimacy than efficiency. More interested in being intimate and speaking to your heart than what is more efficient to get something done. How beautiful. How emotional. What a moment to hear the sounds and syllables and vocabulary and the construction of, of grammar that comes together in a way that is unique to your childhood experience. Um, I grew up in a very traditional Indian family. And my mom makes some incredible Indian food. My favorite dish that she ever made, and she ever does make, I'm hoping she'll continue to make it for a long time coming, is biryani. It is chicken or lamb biryani. Yeah, we can clap for that. We can clap. And for all of y'all that are not cla clapping, you're, you're wondering, let me explain what biryani is. Biryani is this rice that is put together that is infused with aromatic spices. At the very bottom, you have a bed of onions and meat, typically chicken or lamb, and yet it's not fully cooked until it's put into uh, an oven to be baked over hours of time. Over that time, just so you know, the way that the heat works is heat rises. Did y'all know that? Heat rises. Guess what's rising? rising up into all of this rice, the lamb or the chicken and the onions and the spices, it's being infused into the rice. And this is what biryani is. And it's incredible because it takes hours. And so it's also a little bit frustrating because you're smelling this taking place for hours. And so all of a sudden the oven opens up and you pull the biryani out and you, you put it on the table and we just want to dive into it. But my mom would always stop and say, no, 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 hold on. There's a very important process in the biryani. You take the aluminum top off of it and that's the smell. Oh my gosh, it is so great. But then you got to take a spoon. And with that spoon, you got to dig in deep because all that chicken or all that lamb and all the onions and all the spices are embedded at the bottom. You got to mix that bad boy up real good. And then you get what is glorious in biryani. Oh. Right? In that moment, as I described all of those things, I was transported back into a moment of my childhood, I could smell, I could experience, I could feel. How good would it have been for those people to distinctly and diversely experience the gospel message for the first time and to know that there is a God of the universe who loves them so much that he would make it so that they would hear the good news of the risen Messiah in their own language. This is the God that we serve. This is the God who loves us today and adores us today. Our God is more concerned with intimacy of our hearts and the cultivation of our hearts than the efficiency of what we do. And yet, the incredible thing is, the way that he cultivates our hearts, the way that he is intimate with us, it absolutely demands a type of living, a type of being, a type of, of family consistency that looks and sees diversity and distinction not as something that needs to be obliterated, but as redeemed and restored and celebrated. So what can we know about biblical unity? 
Well, we've dismissed these two false narratives, right? That it requires uniformity and a loss of your distinction. What can we know? Biblical unity is not uniformity. Biblical unity is a harmony. And here's the third one. Biblical unity is a vision of the already but not yet. When you and I come together and form this beautiful household of God, we put not just a picture, but tangible evidence to a world that is desperate for peace to not just see, but to experience what a peaceful household could look like. To marvel at how one person could think this, and another person could think this, and yet they come together because they've been united by the blood of Jesus. That they can, catch this, process through hard conversations, not run away from. That they can embrace compassionate hearts and love each other in times of need. This begs the question, how? How do we live out a biblical unity that is a harmony. Well, I'll end with the way that we began, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. I think Paul gives us the litmus test of what is absolutely required of the family of God. And he does it this way. He says, put on. He uses that put on language. Think about just like clothing for a second or your shoes or whatever else you put on. If you put them on, do you ever have to kind of take them off? Probably. And then what do you do the next day? put something back on. I think that this language is super important because it actually identifies that there can be times that we either act in accordance with what we put on or in accordance with what we have put off. So what is it that we're putting on and what is it that we're putting off? This is what Paul says. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Have a heart that is soft, not hard. Kindness Have a heart that is bent towards other people, not away. Humility. Have a right awareness of who you are in light of who God is. Meekness. It's not being weak, but it's having a bridled strength to be used at an appropriate time. And patience, because this is hard. Then he says this, bearing with one another And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, and before we could even say, but, he says, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So, you also must forgive. This isn't an option, it's a command. What is forgiveness? It is the releasing of an offense and refusing to allow that offense captivate you and imprison you. And then he says this, above all of this, like, all this is good, y'all, but you want to see this actually work together? Above all of this, put on love. So I would maybe reread this list a different way. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, loving and compassionate hearts, loving kindness, a loving humility, loving meekness, loving patience, bear with one another in love, and when the other person, the people have complaints against you, love them and forgive them just as God in Christ forgave you because he loved you and he loves you. And what happens when we do this? All of these things are bound together in perfect harmony. It's impossible once we've heard the distinct tone of that violin, for it to forever be lost in the full sound of everything else. I guarantee you, even as we sing this closing song, there'll be a moment where you will just capture that unique tone of the violin, or you'll hear the bass just slide in deep one for a low rumble, or you'll hear Mario on the drums just do an incredible fill. You'll hear the pat... That's the beauty of harmony. That's the beauty of being aware of the individual so that you can celebrate in the whole. This is what biblical unity is. It's a harmony. Let's pray. Lord, you're so kind to us. 
you have gone before us. You have designed us intimately and intricately with purpose, with passion, not so that our stories or the distinct aspects of who we are can be lost, but so they can be redeemed and restored and celebrated so we can play our part together in what comes together as the multi-ethnic, multi-generational, global family of God. What a beautiful vision of a future hope that we can experience now in the present. Amen.
Sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that the blood will not lose its power. Sometimes just the simple truth and the reality that we get to live in is that the blood will not lose its power. And I do not know about you, but I need to remember that the blood has not lost its power. with me family father we thank you that the blood has not lost its power that from the very beginning of time you saw fit that we would be called your family and your own and for us your sons and your daughters who have shown up today hungry for you God would you help us to remember that the blood is the love that binds us God, would you help us to remember that it's your love that restores us? Oh man, I, I don't know who this is for, but I, I, God needs you to know that the grace, that the blood, that the empty tomb is enough to bring about reconciliation in your home. I don't know what relationship is broken. I don't know what heart is shattered into pieces. I don't know what soul is tattered, but I need you to know that the blood is enough Father, we thank you that, it, that, that your love is that belt that Dr. Joel was talking about. It's what, it's what binds us and keeps us together. Father, would you, would you remind us, God, 
when we can't seem to keep going, that when, when, when all hope is lost, when the world is dark, when we can't seem to see through the fog, would you remind us that your love is holding us together when everything else is falling apart? And whether you're watching online or if you're in the room today and you're, and you're saying, Alex, I, I want to believe that this is true, but man, it just feels so distant. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus and maybe you're not. Maybe you have no idea who Jesus is. Either way, here's some really good news. There is a grace that was given to us when Jesus rose on that third day. And so whether you are feeling a tug in your heart and, you, and you're saying, Alex, I want to follow Jesus. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus and you have to just take a moment to recommit your life to, to say, Jesus, I've, I've gone away. I've turned away from your love. I just want you to just say this simple prayer. Say this simple prayer. It's, it's so simple, but it's so true and it's so good. Here it is. Mm. Jesus, I believe that you died and that you rose on the third day, that you took disgrace to give me grace. I believe that without you, I am nothing. And so I give my life to you and I confess with my mouth and profess in my own heart that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, would you remind me and help me to live like you? God, help me to forgive those who have hurt me because you have forgiven me. Jesus, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the unity that you bring in it. And so God, we give our lives to you as a, as a living sacrifice. Lord, you are good. And it is because of your grace that we get to be called your own. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. If you are watching online and, and you decided to follow Jesus just now, would you take a moment and fill out that QR code? We, we want to walk with you. Life is already hard enough. And so let us know we have a team of servant leaders and, and staff members who just love you and want you to know that Jesus loves you too. And if you're in the room today and you uh, made a decision to follow Jesus, you just made the most important decision of your life. And so because of that, we want to rally, we want to celebrate. Would you let us know by, by uh, checking that connection card out for us? Take it to the lobby. We want to walk alongside you. We want to bear witness to the love of Jesus as the body of Christ. And so make sure that you let us know and uh, praise God. What an incredible day. Amen, amen. All right, I'm gonna just read our soul tattoo for today. And that is just, you know, take away from today's message. Um, and today's soul tattoo is to seek to live in biblical unity. And one way you can do that is through action step today. Download our four week Bible study guide. Uh, it's on our website. If you like the paper, you can also get a printed version. And basically we're walking through the names of God. And it's a great opportunity to invite someone uh, to read it and do it with you. Um, and we're just encouraged to kind of provide those resources for you. Let's give Joel another hand. Woo! He did such a great job yeah. today. Um, Amen.